Hey everyone, welcome to Silver Creek Fellowship. My name's Corey and I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for being with us today. Our Thursday church preaching series is on the parables of Jesus. These messages are from services that happened at Silver Creek Fellowship in 2018. Even though they were intended for a live audience a couple of years ago, we believe the truth in these messages is still relevant and helpful for us today. Tonight, we're going to worship by singing a few songs together. We're going to learn from the Bible, but right now, at this moment, I want to encourage you to participate by giving. We're helping more people than ever through ministries like our Mission of Hope Food Pantry. We're working together to make sure people are spiritually healthy through this difficult time, and we're doing our best to serve those around us and share Jesus' love. We've had people make first-time commitments to follow Jesus, and new people that have joined our church even during this unique time. I want to encourage you right now to take a moment and give to support what God is doing here through our church. If you're watching live with us, you can click in the giving box in the chat. It won't interrupt your view of the service, so you can do it right now. You can also give at any time by visiting scf.tv giving or mailing your check to P.O. Box 8 in Silverton. If you're interested in giving help to one of our ministries in Silverton, visit scf.tv and click the Give Help button. Please fill out a connection card tonight, and if you'd like prayer during this service, click on the live prayer button, and one of our prayer team will pray with you right now. We're going to worship. Let's lift our voices together and sing, because our God is great, and He is worthy of our praise. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Oh, see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifts. 
desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul.
tonight, we're going to be jumping right back into our series that we've been in on Jesus and his parables. And tonight, we're going to continue um, with one of, I say this every week, I, I'm sorry, but this is one of my favorite parables. Now, they're all one of my favorite. They're so good, right? Uh, have any of you found yourself during the week remembering the characters and the stories from these parables. All of a sudden you find yourself in the story, you find uh, an attitude or a situation of the story and it comes back to life at you. This keeps happening to me anyway. It's almost like Jesus may have known what he was doing 2,000 years ago as he told these stories. I love a good story, but don't we all? Uh, Stories, this isn't something new. Going all the way back to the beginning of humanity, stories have always played a huge role in how we communicate with each other. That's why movies and books and plays can move us and affect us in such an incredibly powerful way. I think this is an important side moment that we, uh, that we pay attention to this fact. I want to warn you of something. If we're so shaped by stories and so influenced by stories, let me ask you a question. What type of stories are you giving permission to change your life? Because you see, that's what stories do. Stories affect us into our deepest places of our humanity. They imprint in our subconscious. They go to the deepest parts of who we are. And just like seed stories get into us, and guess what they do? They start to produce fruit in our life. One of my mentors, a guy who passed away several years ago named Dale Price, who started Canyon View Camp, he used to always tell us that the actions and stuff that we see from people on the outside is determined by the consumption of stories and of sin on the outside. It begins to work itself through in our life. And so I want to warn you and ask you, what type of stories are you consuming. Robert McKee, he's a famous professor at USC. He actually um, is the guy who who is like the guru of American storytelling. He's the guy who teaches at USC film school all the classes on um, screenwriting. He, He teaches classes on novelization. He is the guy, if you are wanting a career as a screenwriter, you go and attend his classes. And this is what he said about storytelling. I've got this quote for you on the screen. He said, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. Stories have power. They delight. They enchant. They touch. They teach. They recall. They inspire. They motivate. They challenge. They help us understand. They imprint a picture on our minds. What to make, what to make a point or raise an issue. If you want to make a point or raise an issue, tell a story. So tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at another story of Jesus that comes from Luke chapter 14. But before we jump into our stories, I think it's important when you have a story to understand the context of the story, the scene that's setting this story up. So starting at this point in Jesus' ministry, starting actually in chapter 13 of the book of Luke, he is on his way to the city of Jerusalem. Now, when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be put on a cross, and he's going to die. This is the trip to Jerusalem that ultimately is going to lead to Jesus' death. And if you notice in your Bible, when you look from chapter 13 to chapter 22, it's almost all, in the book of Luke, a story that Jesus is telling. It's parable after parable after parable after parable. All the red writing you find in that section of scripture is, and Jesus told a story, and Jesus told a story, and Jesus told a story. This whole giant section of scripture. Now, in chapter 13, Jesus, on the Sabbath day, had gone to a synagogue, and he was teaching at this synagogue. Now, on the Sabbath day, when we hear Sabbath living in our Western culture, We might think church day, right? Like church day. This is Thursday night. This is our Sabbath day because it's when we go to church. But to the Jewish culture in the first century, Sabbath was not just the day they attended church. 
You see, Sabbath was so much more than just that. Sabbath began at sunset on Friday night, and it ended at sunset on Saturday night. And Sabbath was actually one of the things that God had commanded to his people, a Sabbath day rest, in the Ten Commandments, like the Big Ten, right? God had said, you're going to keep the Sabbath day, and you're going to rest on the Sabbath day. But see, God intended to give his people this day of rest. But as God intends this, what does man do? Man starts to think, you know what, we can help God on this by giving some interpretation to what this means. So by the time Jesus is on the scene, we get these stories. Like Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath and tells him, pick up your mat and walk. And the man picks up his mat and goes walking down the street. He bumps into a Pharisee and the Pharisee says, what are you doing carrying your mat? It's the Sabbath, you sinner. And he says, ah, well, the guy who healed me of my disease told me to pick up my mat and walk. And now they've got an even bigger sinner, right? Because it's one thing to carry your mat on the Sabbath, but a guy who's healing people on the Sabbath, this is a huge problem. So here's Jesus on the Sabbath, Teaching in a synagogue, he, no way, he's going to heal somebody at a synagogue on the Sabbath. (laughs) Of course he is, it's Jesus. If you look through the Gospels, you'll see that so many times when Jesus initiates a healing and seeks someone out to heal them, guess what day it is? It's the Sabbath, over and over again. And so now, guess what? It's the Sabbath, and Jesus is teaching, and he sees a woman who's bent over at the waist. And it says in the Bible that for 18 years, that's how she's been. Well, Jesus, he's moved. And Jesus says, stand up straight. She's healed. And you think everybody there would be like, oh, miracle, this is wonderful. But that's not what happens. Look at what it says in Luke 13, verse 14. It says, but the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. So this is chapter 13. Now, Jesus then in that moment does as Jesus often does. He tells a story. And as he tells the story, he points out to them how they are living in hypocrisy with their interpretation of God's law. And then we lead into chapter 14. Now, chapter 14, here we find ourselves, guess what day it is? Once again, it's the Sabbath. Here, 13, and now 14. And chapter 14 starts out like this. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Now, I just want to stop and look at the story for a minute. This would have been a very common thing. You come to a village as a traveling rabbi, a traveling teacher, and the village leaders, the religious leaders of the village would have you come in. Because what? They're going to ask you questions. They're going to see what your politics are, what your theology is, what your understanding of God's law is. They're going to see if you're legit, right? And so as Jesus gets into this home to see if he's legit, obviously they know about what Jesus has just done on the Sabbath right, in the synagogue. And so I believe that this guy who's there is there because they want to see if Jesus dares heal another man in the house of the head of the Pharisees on the Sabbath day, right? Because let me just ask you, do you think the Pharisees had a habit of inviting people who were severely ill into their house for dinner on the Sabbath day? From their complaints against Jesus in the previous chapter, I don't think that that is a normal occurrence. And Jesus knows exactly what they're doing. In fact, it says they were watching him intently, right? They're thinking, okay, the bait is in place. Let's have dinner. So Jesus asks a question. This is what Jesus does, right? How many times have we seen this so far in Jesus's model? Jesus, verse three, Jesus asks the Pharisees and experts in the religious law. Get a picture of who's here, right? Pharisees, head of the Pharisees, his house. We got Pharisees and experts in the law. He asks them, is it permitted in the law 
to heal people on the Sabbath day or not. Now, what had the leader in the synagogue said in the previous chapter? Did he think that it was permitted? No, he had already, they've already said very clearly that they don't believe this is something that's permissible. But look what it says here. But they refused to answer. I think at this point they're thinking, let's see if he'll do it. Let's see if he'll do it. What do you think he's going to do? Well, what do you think Jesus is going to do? Jesus sees someone who's in need. So it says Jesus touches the sick man and he heals him. And this is why I believe that this man was there as a trap, because look what happens next. And he sends him away. This guy's not there for dinner, okay? He doesn't stay for dinner, does he? Jesus heals him, and then he leaves. Now, again, he turns to them and says, pointing out hypocrisy, which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? If your son or your cow, right, big difference there, if your son or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush to get him out? Again, they could not answer. So picture in your mind, the leader of the Pharisees, he's got Jesus over for dinner. It's the Sabbath. Conveniently, he's got a sick guy there, right? Jesus heals this guy. They're daring him to do it, and he does it. As Jesus points out this, this amazing hypocrisy to say, listen, if something is valuable to you or if, if you love someone and care about someone and you see them in need and it's a Sabbath, you'll help them, won't you? And they're thinking, oh, can't really answer that question, right? Because again, this is all about their interpretation of the law of Moses, what they interpreted to be sin. So, Can you now picture the context of the beginning of this dinner party? Do you think this is a very comfortable moment now? Hey, everybody, let's eat dinner. Anyone ever been to a really awkward dinner party before, right? I was just today thinking if you watch the office of the episode, they go over to Michael's house and it's just the most awkward night ever. And I'm thinking that Jesus here, he heals the man. The Pharisees are now, you know, they're kind of at a loss for words, which how often are Pharisees? at a loss for words, right? They're, they, not often, okay? So now, all of a sudden, look, you think maybe Jesus will just sit back and play nice now, right? Jesus is just gonna, okay, he's made his scene, right? Now he's just gonna relax. Verse seven, when Jesus noticed that all who had come to dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you'll have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he'll come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then he turned to the host. (laughs) When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, for they'll invite you back. That will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Way to blend in, Jesus, right? He First, he points out the pride in all of the other guests at the party, and then he turns to the host and tells them that the host has um, maybe bad motives in who he's invited to come to this party. So Jesus just blends in, right? So now can you sense the tension? Jesus has healed the man. That was the first. Now they're sitting at the table and he tells all of the other guests that are there that they're full of pride and then tells the host. I mean, I'm thinking at this point I'd be looking for an excuse to leave this party, right? You're like looking at your phone. You're like, has anyone text me? Is there anything going on that maybe I could use it as an excuse for this one? Anything, please. So all of a sudden, now, All of a sudden, whether it's to break the tension or all of a sudden, whether it's because he just wants to get through this awkward moment 
or all of a sudden because he's ready to challenge Jesus with another point of theology or philosophy. Jesus has just made this statement at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you. And this man blurts out, it says this, verse 15, hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Now, certainly Jesus won't have anything to say about that. It's just, right? It's just a great statement the man has made. Yes, right, brother. I mean, the Jewish leaders who were present at the dinner party that day would have believed that because of their devotion to the law and their pedigree and their bloodline, that they had already been guaranteed a seat at God's table for his great banquet. See, they were Jews, and not just any Jews, right? These are like the Jew of Jews, right? These are the cream of the crop. And they would have expected this. They would have expected that Jesus' answer to this, his statement to this, would have gone something like this. Oh, yes, if you will keep the law in a precise fashion, on that great day, you will be counted worthy and you will dine with the Messiah. And they would have just, as they reclined around the table together at this dinner, they would have nodded their head and thought, good answer. Now, the next point of the night. Let's move on to another piece of theology, another discussion. But Jesus, (laughs) Jesus answers this statement very, very differently than the Pharisees and leaders of this time would have expected him to answer it. You see, this talk of messianic banquet, God's banquet, has been happening amongst the Jews for 700 years at this point. This conversation was a regular conversation that they would have had about this messianic banquet. And actually, it comes from a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, written 700 years before this. And here is Isaiah's great prophecy Chapter 25, verse 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of all will make a supper of good things ready for all people. It will be a supper of good wine, of the best foods, and of fine wine. And on this mountain, he will destroy the covering which is over all people, the covering which is spread over all nations. He will take away death for all time. The Lord God will dry tears from all faces. He will take away the shame of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said in that day, See, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and full of joy because he saves us. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful prophetic picture of God's great banquet party. And who is this party for? It's for all people, right? All people, all nations, But sadly, in the first century during Jesus' time, the Jewish nation had lost sight of this reality, this truth of God's plan. Now, from the very beginning, as God spoke this plan to his people, to Abraham, remember when he spoke the promise to Abraham, he said that the promised blessing was going to bless Abraham so that what? Abraham would be a blessing to all people. That was from the beginning. But over the years and over time, this idea had been lost. And the Jews in this day and age, in the first century, no longer believed that the feast was for all people. Now, in the sixth, and I'm a, I'm a history guy, you guys know that about me by now, so I like to bring some history always into these things so that we have, uh, maybe it helps us to color with deeper colors to understand the context of these stories. In the sixth century, before Jesus, that's, you know, the before the B.C., before Christ, 6th century, um, the Jewish nation was carried off into exile by the nation of Babylon. Now, the, 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 the southern kingdom that went into exile in Babylon, during their time there, lots changed. 
But one of the things that changes, they went in captivity speaking Hebrew, and when they came out of captivity, they had a new language. It was, it was this language of Aramaic. It's the language that's being spoken in the first century in the day of Jesus, the language Aramaic. Now, here's the thing. The scripture was written in Hebrew. But as they came out of captivity, now you had a nation of people who were not native Hebrew speaking. They were native Aramaic speaking. So even if they had a basic understanding of Hebrew, there would be scholars who would help them now in understanding Scripture. So when Scripture was read in Hebrew in a synagogue, then an expert in language would come and give them an oral paraphrase teaching of what the Hebrew Scripture said, but now in Aramaic, the language the people understand. That process was called Targum. So Targum was an oral passing down, an oral teaching of these stories in paraphrase form to help them to understand. Targum was not supposed to be written down. It was not considered scripture, but of of teaching to help people in understanding. But guess what? Over time, it begins to become written down, especially by the the, the highest level teachers, the highest level um, Pharisees. Theirs would be written down so it could be passed among their followers and studied. And in the first century, the very first Aramaic version of the Old Testament law was beginning to be circulated. But it wasn't a translation like what we have our biblical translations today. It was more like somebody made the message translation or like the living Bible. It was a paraphrased version. And what happens is when we read it, we can actually begin to see some of the heart, some of the bent, some of the thinking of those first century Jewish people as they wrote down these paraphrases of Scripture. Now, we actually have today first century Targum paraphrases of the book of Isaiah. And this is, I'm going to read for you, the paraphrase of that very same scripture that we just read so that you can see what the Jews believed about this great feast of God. This is verse Isaiah 25, verse 6 of the paraphrase from the Jews of the first century. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make a feast and a banquet They think that it shall be for their glory, but it shall be to them for disgrace and for mighty afflictions, from which they shall not deliver themselves, afflictions through which they shall come to an end. See, Isaiah's beautiful prophecy for all nations and all people still stayed for all nations and all people, but instead of being God's blessing, it became the wrath of God poured out on those who were no longer fitting to be at the table with the Messiah. In fact, in the second century, the book of Enoch was written. In the second century, this book of Enoch takes this messianic feast idea one step further. It becomes even more brutal, even more violent. In the book of Enoch, this feast is described, and it's told that everyone is invited, but the angel of death is actually at the table with everyone else, and as they take a seat, the angel of death takes his sword, he kills all of the unworthy Gentiles, and then the Jewish people who are righteous wade through the blood of the Gentiles into the banquet hall where they're redeemed by the Messiah and given a seat at the table. See, this is the thinking of the first century Jew in regards to the banquet of God and the Gentile. So when this man blurts out, well, because remember, these are pious religious Jews, and so when he blurts out, what a blessing it will be when we attend this banquet of the King of God. You get verse 16, it says, Jesus replied. Now, Jesus replied, what? He's replying to that statement, right? What a blessing it'll be when we attend the banquet in the kingdom of God. And it says, Jesus replied with a story. Of course he did, right? Of course he did. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. 
When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. So the, the context of the story is important. They're talking about the banquet of God, the banquet of the kingdom of God, the messianic kingdom banquet. And Jesus begins to tell a story. It's not just any feast, it's a great feast. Many people are being invited. And just like today, we still invite people to to parties the same way. If you're going to have a wedding, nowadays, it's crazy, we do like three levels of invitation, right? You first get your save the date in the mail, just to let you know, hey, you're going to get invited, right? And then the next thing that comes, you get an invitation, which you have to RSVP for, right? And then that goes back, and then the actual day of the event, you show up to the wedding. Now, I want you to just picture this idea. You've decided, you've saved the date, you've RSVP'd to the wedding, which when you RSVP, what does that tell the people who are throwing the party? And why would they want to know who's coming? Because they're going to prepare a meal, right? And in this century, what they would have done is they would have prepared a meal according to how many guests were coming, same way we would. So that would mean the slaughter of different types or quantities of animals to ready themselves for their guests. Because their banquets aren't just like our one night, one hour event, right? You're not coming to a banquet and then you're home by eight, okay? Banquet is a big deal and you're going to have a party with these people and he's going to prepare himself for that party. And so the invitations have gone out and then when the meal is ready, he's going to send his servants to begin bringing people in to the banquet. Come on in, everybody. It's time. So just, we, I was thinking about this like maybe you have had a dinner party, like a formal dinner party at your house before, and the guests show up on time. Maybe they're in the living room having hors d'oeuvres, and then at some point somebody at the banquet, someone at your party comes out and says, okay, dinner's ready, everybody. Come in, right? So they're there, they're ready. Now the table is set, and listen to what happens. Instead of going in, verse 18, but they began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pair of oxen, and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I just got married, so can't come. See, this is the part of the story where those who are listening, this would have been unexpected. Because remember, what's the context of the, this banquet he's talking about? The kingdom of God, this messianic banquet why would anyone not be interested in attending why would anyone that rsvp not show up this is like again your friends standing in your living room you say okay come on in they, dinner's ready and somebody in the living room's like oh wait i just remembered i gotta go mow my lawn right and they leave and or somebody else says oh uh i just remembered i forgot to pay the bills this month and out they go right or Maybe you want to be as vulgar as the third and say, hey, I just got married and you know, I got to go home. This is ridiculous, these insults to the host. Let me help you understand, these are not good excuses. We might read these excuses in our Western world and think, oh, that's not, yeah, we bought a field, oxen, marriage, home. these are good excuses. These were not good excuses, and the people listening to the story that day would not have thought those were good, legitimate excuses. Let me just ask you, even in our culture today, if you were going to buy a field, which by the way, they live in a desert environment, and fields that are fertile and able to produce crops are few and far between, and fields that are able to produce crops that face the winter sun in order to actually during the rainy season be able to stay in a productive mode are even more rare could you imagine in that context somebody being sight unseen buying a piece of property in a culture where property meant everything the fields had names i mean all through scripture in the old testament you see these these recurring ideas of this person's field that you think they just oh you know what i I think i'll buy that i've never seen it but i think it sounds nice no it's ridiculous Oxen work in pairs together as a team. If you have an oxen that's unequally yoked to another oxen and don't pull together, guess what? They don't work. If you were going to buy five pairs of oxen, which is a whole lot of oxen, you were going to make that kind of investment, don't you think he probably would have worked those oxen? Don't you think he would have seen those oxen work, been aware of the oxen? You think he just picked up his phone one day and ordered oxen out of the catalog and then said, I got to go pick them up? No, this is not how it would have worked. 
And the third excuse, guys, this is the worst one of all. Absolutely insulting because weddings in the Jewish culture were not a small event. They lasted weeks sometimes. Everyone would have been invited. It would have been a feast. Do you think anyone just, you know, oh, I just got married? No, that's not how weddings work. This guy is intentionally being vulgar in this moment with the host. These were not good excuses. These people had conspired together. If one person has an excuse, you know, if something comes up, right, if you go out to your living room and one person says, hey, this thing just happened, I really do have to go, that might be understandable. But can you imagine everyone leaving, all with a lame excuse together? The intent of this is to shame the host. The intent of this is to put the host out. The host has gone to great expense of himself, and now all the guests are gone. The intent of this, they've, it's collusion, right? Against the host together. Verse 21 says, The servant returned. Can you imagine this servant? He's gone to the other, right? He's gone to get everybody. He's gotten these excuses. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. I love this part of the story. See, because Jesus is just so good at this. You see, when Jesus said the master was angry, he was furious, and he said, go quickly into the streets, the next sentence that the Pharisees, religious leaders were expecting was, and bring them back here for judgment. Get them by the scruff of their neck and bring them to me. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, he said, go and get them. Go instead, he says, and get the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait. Remember this Feast, who is he talking to at this feast and telling this whole story? In their mind, the poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind, they've got no seat at the table. They're not going to be at the table. They're not going to be invited to the feast. It's God's judgment in their thinking that's upon these people's lives. They're not invited or welcome. They're cursed. But see, Jesus is bringing back Isaiah's beautiful prophecy to the forefront, to the mind and ears of the hearers, and he's not done yet. Verse 22, after the servant had done this, he reported, there's still room for more. So his master said, then go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. Go even further. Keep on going. Get anyone and everyone. Get the travelers that are passing by. Get them all. Everyone. Anyone that will come. And don't just hand out an invite, right? Don't just put a sticky note on the door. I want you to compel them to come. Literally, take them by the arm. And bring them in. They're all invited. See, first he says, go get from among my people. The broken, the outcast, the poor, the sick. And then he says, don't stop there. Go and get the Gentiles too. The ones that don't live here. The ones from the outside. The ones that are just passing by. And why? Because it says the master is desperate to have you at his feast. That would have been shocking to the hearers. He's saying, fill up my house with everyone. All are welcome. All people, compel them. Go and get them. Remember, who's at the dinner party? Who's listening to Jesus right now? What is their understanding about the feast? Let me ask you, what's your understanding 
about God's feast. You believe that you have a place at God's feast because of all the good stuff that you've done? Because you're not as sinful as someone else you know? Do you think that it's because you've gone to church? Because you're here tonight? Do you think it's because your grandma believed in Jesus and talked about him when you were a kid? See, the listeners in this room were relying on the wrong thing to get them into the feast. In fact, Jesus is now going to drop by far the biggest bombshell of the conversation. Verse 24. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Wait, so who, who is hosting this great feast that we've been hearing about? See, up until this point, Jesus has been telling a story about this master and the feast. But all of a sudden, what does the language change to? Jesus changes the language and says, it's my feast. The Messianic feast is my feast. Jesus is the host. See, up until this point, it was about the master's feast. But now Jesus has switched it. And believe me, this is intentional. And definitely the people listening to the story would have noticed when he did it. Jesus is saying that the Messianic feast is his feast. And nobody is getting in based on their own self-righteousness. Nobody is getting in because of their heritage or their skin color or their language. And nobody is uninvited for any of those same reasons either. Everyone, anyone who's coming to this feast is coming because they accept and receive the invitation from Jesus to attend. This is the catch. You have to accept the invitation. The invitation has been offered to all of us. The invitation was offered to everyone that Jesus was telling this story to as well. But guess what? Just like happens to us many times. We RSVP, right? We're, we want the host to think we're, we're a part. But then when it comes time to come in and sit down at the table, what happens? Well, you know, work is really busy right now. Or this new relationship that I have, it's just, you know, it's in that stage. It's just not good timing. And we begin, just like the characters in the story, to find excuse after excuse after excuse of why it's not the right time now. Well, you know, I've got to go check this thing out first. I'm planning on, uh, but it's just not the right time. This is how the parables are so powerful. This cut me deep as I'm reading myself and thinking areas in my life where I know God has called me to the table and I'm still making excuses about why the timing isn't right on my end. I told the people in the prayer meeting this morning some specific things. I I feel God's talked to me specifically about his desire to see children's ministry take another step in this church. But I keep making excuses on why the timing isn't right right now. You know, the resource here, the people here. And God's telling me personally, he's saying, do you want to come and sit down? I'll put the table out for you. Whose feast is it? What is your responsibility at the feast? It's to sit down at the table. Maybe you're here and you relate to different characters in the story. It's how the parables are so awesome. Maybe you're like those first people who are making excuses about why they couldn't. Maybe you relate more to the sick 
and the broken and the hurting and the crippled and the blind that people have passed over and now you're being invited to come. Maybe you relate best to the people who are out on the highway. They've never even heard of the master, right? The sick and the crippled and the blind, they're living in the same area. They probably knew who the master was. But the people who are just passing by on the road, they don't know who the master is. Somebody just came and said, you got to come. There's a great party. There's a spot for you at it. It'll be really good. I promise. And you walked in thinking, I don't know anything about this. You might be here tonight just like that guy. Just like the one who somebody just said, come on. And somebody keeps saying, come on. Somebody keeps compelling you to come. But you don't know the master. Well, let me tell you, I know the master. His name is Jesus and he is so good and so kind and so wonderful. that I cannot compel you with strong enough language to not wait anymore to come and sit down at the feast. See, God has something so good in store for every single one of you. No matter what your background, no matter what you've experienced up until this point in your religious and in your life of faith, God's got more. He's got more courses. He's got more abundance. He's got more for you to sit and enjoy and eat. But how many of us are saying, no, actually, I've had enough? And the Father, the Master, Jesus are saying, come on. Go get them. Another place we now, church, get to play the role of servant. Who having been invited also to the banquet, gets now to go and help fill up the master's house. That's what the church is all about. Go and compel them to come. See, because we believe that the banquet is for everyone. Anyone who would accept the invitation of Jesus and receive from him will be granted eternal life. There's nobody, regardless of your background, your sin, whatever you're screwed up in right now, there's nobody that's not invited. Everyone is welcome to come because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, tonight, band, you can come. Tonight, we're going to worship God. One of the things that I love is that we actually have a, a picture, a, a word picture, a, 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 a way right now before we get to the end feast, right? There's a feast coming one day. The book of Revelation shows us that feast. It's going to be really good. In the meantime, as we wait for the day that we all sit at the table, we actually have the communion table that represents the elements that purchased your right to come to the party. In the blood and in the, the body of Jesus that was broken and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, that is the way that you have access to God's banquet table. And so tonight as we worship, we can symbolically remember and give thanks to God for the great price that was paid so that you and I could come to the party. And if you're here tonight and you've never made the decision to sit down at the table, then I want to help you tonight to take that step. There's several things. There's several things the Bible tells us, but listen, I never, ever, ever want to complicate the invitation to come and sit down at the table because Jesus didn't complicate it either. If you're here tonight and while we're worshiping, you're interested in finding out more than that, I'll be right here. Come and talk to me. Afterwards, if it's too awkward to come up here, talk to me. And I would love to pray with you and see your invitation get turned in and you be able to sit down at the table. If you want to be baptized, if maybe you've accepted the invitation, but maybe you're like the guys who are still standing outside the party, baptism is another symbolic act that we take that says, okay, I'm going to be a guest at the banquet. I'm joining God's family. That's what baptism is. Baptism is our way of saying, I want to be part of God's family and I want other people to know about it. If you want to do that, talk to me. We're going to start on a regular basis having baptism here on a Thursday night service and I'm believing that God's going to see people saved, see people baptized and see this thing just start going. Now let's stand. Before we worship, let's pray together. And I just want to commission you all as well. As servants, 
of Jesus to go and to compel others to come. So Lord, first and foremost, thank you that we are invited to the banquet. Thank you that we are not excluded. Thank you that it is not just for a a special few religious elite, but that you have called me a sinner, a Gentile, someone who was away from you, an enemy of God. You've given me an invitation to the great party, and I want to say, yes, I'm coming. Yes, I'm in. Yes, I want a seat at the table. And thank you, Jesus, that you have given us access to the goodness, abundance, and blessing of the Father. Jesus, tonight, I want to commission my friends here in this place as servants of the living God, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, to go and compel them all through our city, to the ends of our city, to the ends of the earth, that we would compel them to come to the great banquet party feast of the Messiah, the Lamb of God. I pray, God, that we will, we will with urgency take this invitation Because it's such good news to anyone and everyone telling them that the very greatest, most wonderful thing lies in store for them if they will come and see. So Lord, I pray that you help us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you empower us. And I pray that we will, as ambassadors and servants of the living God, compel them to come in and take their place at the Lord's table. Thank you, God. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together wherever we're at. Why don't we lift our voices and sing, My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name let's sing that again my hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness
righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. He shall come with trumpet sound.
Jesus, thank you that your love is greater than all of our fears. Your love is greater than all of our failures, and your love reaches us. Today we say, Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We want to live our lives for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. We want you to be part of a small group so that you can be in relationship with others who will pray for you and encourage you. If you're interested in joining a small group, fill out a connection card and we'll be in touch with more information about a group you can join. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you soon.